uh, my connection with the International Education Center came when Mr. Saka was visiting the United States, and I was fortunate enough to uh, meet him and take him around in my, uh, what then was a, a very vintage Toyota Land Cruiser, uh, 15 years old. And I remember clearly uh, Mr. Saka's comment in a raging snowstorm uh, this is a, a, a an, the Toyota had no heater, uh, no windows, just a canvas top, and he was kind enough only to say, "We don't have any more of these in Japan." Uh, well, we we don't have ours anymore either. But uh, uh, it is also nice to be in Tokyo, where at least uh, you have water. Uh, Fukuoka is now down to six hours a day of water. And uh, uh, apparently, uh, by the end of September, we'll complete, completely run out. Uh, so if from time to, time to time I go to the pitcher, you'll understand why. It's not to drink now, I'm taking it home with me. <laughs> In the 1960s, People who were interested in uh, what we call the health food movement, natural foods, argued that you are what you eat. That is to say that if you ate a certain kind of food, it gave you a certain kind of disposition. Rather, today, let me change that to say we are what we are from the way we are educated. Uh, perhaps something we can take up later from uh, my brief experience in a Japanese educational system. But uh, in the United States, I think it is true that education, that is, the and today I'm referring to higher education, uh, colleges and universities, rather than high schools or elementary education, that we <clears throat> have a certain number of assumptions about our society, what are its goals, all of these things which are brought out through our educational experience. Uh, Japan's educational system uh, was developed uh, <clears throat> largely after the war, at least the present educational system, uh, with uh, consciously the aid of uh, the staff of uh, Douglas MacArthur. The United States also, since the Second World War, has undergone extraordinary changes in its education, and those changes, I think, are reflected in the society. Americans tend to talk about the 1950s or the 40s and 50s as an age of apathy, of quiet on the campus. Nothing was happening. They talk about college campuses in the 1960s, not as an age of apathy, but as an age of activism, activity. Things were going on, primarily seen in the civil rights movement and, of course, uh, in the anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam War uh, in the late 1960s and a, a third outgrowth of this activity was the women's movement or the uh, push for uh, more women's uh, rights and equality. The 1970s, the period we are now in, let me argue, is an age of consolidation to see American education as uh, 
a giant pendulum swinging from quiet over to very active, back down to uh, a sort of middle point, a vital center. I want to look at two things today uh, in, look, in uh, reviewing uh, American education and the trends in it. The first is the government, the effect of the government on American education, government policy. The second will be how this policy affected directly and indirectly the uh, nature of American education. And finally, uh, to look at uh, how American education is presently constituted and what may uh, develop in the future, uh, because I think that edu higher education in the United States is rather split and there are two paths that might be followed. As you probably know, the United States is one of the few nations that does not have a national university. Uh, president John Quincy Adams, uh, who was president of the United States between 1821 and 1825, uh, made that proposal to Congress to establish a national university in Washington. Uh, Congress said no, and to the best of my knowledge, the issue has never been raised again. Uh, rather, uh, Americans have gone about, uh, America, the American government has, educate, uh, has changed uh, its uh, university system through another way, uh, rather than establishing national universities, uh, Americans have financed public education uh, through uh, land or money. The first time that the United States government took an active interest in higher education was in 1862 during the Civil War when uh, the Congress passed an act calling for each state to set aside land for public education. So we have state universities rather than national. And uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 a number of Midwestern universities, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, are land grant institutions. Uh, that is, the Congress granted land uh, and the states granted land to those institutions. But there was no other aid to education and government uh, and American education had little in common in that period. And American education until World War II was primarily influenced uh, either by European scholarship or through uh, private grants. The big change was in 1944 when Congress passed what is known as the GI Bill of Rights for soldiers returning from the war. They would pay for education. This brought people into colleges and universities for the first time. People who would not have otherwise gone or sought an education. In effect, what the GI Bill, as Americans call it, did, was place government's stamp of approval. The government felt that education was important. Higher education was important. 
And whereas prior to World War II, where people with a high school diploma, people who graduated from high school, would be readily accepted, now it became important to have a college degree. So we have raised the level. <clears throat> But the 50s, we tend to think about as an age, uh, I am almost tempted to say, uh, of quiet, like uh, I was going to say Japanese students. Uh, certainly on Kyushu, they are more conservative than they are at uh, Todai, uh, or actually anywhere in Tokyo. Uh, but uh, then, the first day I taught at Kudai, uh, I, there were eight radical students out protesting, having barred the doors so I couldn't get in. Um, but I knew the uh, protest was short, uh, would be short-lived because uh, one of the students' mothers came and there was much heated argument and he shook his head this way, and she nodded this way. Again, a shake of the head. Yes, said mother, and points out away from the protest. And finally, she took his arm, and off he went. End of protest. Uh, but the 1950s in America are generally seen as years where college students worked, they studied, uh, they played, fraternities, uh, traditional years uh, of quiet on the campus. This started to change uh, in the late 1950s. Two things influenced the change. One was the Russians, and uh, the other was the civil rights movement. The Russians perhaps had a, as great an effect on American education in the post-war world as anyone, simply by launching the Sputnik in 1956. And that little beep and I remember clearly listening on the radio to that beep of the Russian satellite caused American educators to reevaluate everything they were doing. And it was determined that the Russian school educational system was far better than the American because they had had the technological expertise to uh, put Sputnik into the air. Uh, this was not entirely true, by the way. Uh, the Eisenhower administration had specifically made a decision not to get into uh, satellites, uh, uh, that is, the development of rockets large enough to put a satellite into orbit at that time. Uh, the decision perhaps was a, an error, but it really had little to do with the educational system. But the public was shamed, I believe, into reaction and passed in 1958 the first bill that would uh, aid higher education. And interestingly enough, Americans cannot aid, uh, the Congress cannot aid education itself uh, for educational reasons. This was called the National Defense Education Act. It had to be linked with defending the country not just educating it. Uh, so uh, Americans, for the first time, were given federal aid, individuals were given federal aid for education. 
most all of the money went into the sciences and foreign languages. Uh, it was not until 1964 that the government decided that the humanities, that is, uh, those uh, of us uh, in the social sciences, uh, in uh, literature, in music, in philosophy, the arts, uh, deserved any money. Uh, in 1964, they gave money to the humanities, which I think helped balance the, uh, the uh, uh, heavy weight that uh, the sciences had been given. And finally, in 1965, the next year, again, part of Lyndon Johnson's uh, attempt to bring more to the poor, uh, loans and grants were given to uh, students who could not afford to go to college, and certainly the expense of higher education in the United States is becoming more and more a factor. Uh, Williams College, for an example, now uh, has a tuition of almost $6,000 a year. Uh, it is not the highest. Uh, Yale uh, I believe is still Yale University is the highest, which is now uh, about seven thousand three hundred dollars. Since I don't convert anything to dollars or yen anymore, I've given up since the yen has become so strong. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, a still a very expensive, at least for Americans, expensive uh, education. What this did was change the whole set of goals that educators had. During the 1960s, not only was money, government money, coming in to colleges and universities as it had never done before in building libraries, building science centers, building uh, fine arts centers, building dormitories. Colleges expanded. At the same time, the Vietnam War was operating in such a way that one way that a young man could avoid fighting in Vietnam was to go to college. And he got what was known as a deferment is uh, he could put off, delay his government service. So many people went to colleges who didn't or wouldn't normally intend to, and it was, uh, I believe, what the Japanese would call an education boom, uh, that uh, the whole business expanded uh, and uh, we are now involved in uh, the results of the collapse of that boom, and that is the whole uh, a decline in the numbers of people and in the, in the financial support of higher education. Uh, to give you an example, uh, the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, receives two-thirds, 66% of its total expenditures from the federal government. To give you an idea of the, the, the closeness between the government and certain universities, MIT is probably the highest because of the amount of government contracts it uh, holds. One other additional change is taking place, not a, uh, in terms of money, though it is going to cost money, but in terms of a regulation for equality, and that is uh, the fact that American colleges and universities now cannot discriminate on the basis of sex 
And that has been interpreted to mean that equal money must be spent for, for example, uh, facilities for women as well as men, uh, that uh, uh, money must also go for women's athletic teams, uh, it must go for women's locker rooms, things that schools uh, did not previously uh, take into consideration. Uh, we are probably, uh, Williams is probably closer to that. Uh, when I came to Williams, we were an all-men's college. Uh, it had traditionally been an all-men's school. The school was founded in 1793. It is an old university. Some of its ideas, I think, were that old. But in 1970, we began accepting women, and it was a, a great change uh, that occurred. Uh, not only did we, uh, were we accepting women students, but the government also put pressure on to hire women faculty members. So this is another change in, uh, uh, in hiring practices as well as admission standards. Uh, the other government regulation which is changing American education is to make that education available for everyone, including the handicapped, uh, and uh, thus uh, uh, American colleges and universities will have to adapt to those federal guidelines. The civil rights movement, to, to go back a bit, in the late 1950s, American students, college students, primarily, well, entirely white, began to become interested in the civil rights movement in the South. It was primarily white-led, uh, except uh, for the activities of Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, King, as you remember, uh, led a bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, which served as a catalyst to gel, to keep together the whole civil rights movement. And white students began to go down to help. They went south after 1961 in large numbers. It was the heart of the American educational philosophy. As Arthur Bester, a historian of philosophy of education, put it, education should, quote, deliberately cultivate the ability to think. Moreover, students should not, Bester said, accept what they were told, rather they should challenge those assumptions based on rational uh, thinking, that is to think through the problems of society and to use their education to help to come to grips with those problems in hopes of solving them. American students were taught to question what faculty said, not to accept their lectures. And this is a, a significant difference, I think, in uh, Japanese education, uh, where uh, the uh, professor lectures to the students, and the bell rings, and it is, he is gone. The American classroom has a great deal more give and take between students and professors. Uh, Bester 
argued that students should help to change society, that students could become an important educational and cultural force in uh, the, that society. Uh, indeed, uh, students took him at his word, some did, and a group got together and issued a critique of an American society in 1962. It is a little-known document called the Port Huron Statement. It was written by a man, mostly by a man named Tom Hayden, who later became the head of uh, the student radical group in the United States, uh, SDS, or Students for a Democratic Society, uh, to show you the direction that has gone going. Uh, Hayden had just run for the Senate in California, uh, did not win, but uh, uh, he has uh, uh, become an accepted part of society. Uh, the students had questioned American society much the same as the more traditional Rockefeller Commission, headed by former Vice President Rockefeller, former Governor Rockefeller, uh, uh, had done in uh, 1960. But civil rights was only a part of what students uh, became interested in. Uh, and indeed, most university students got out of civil rights by 1963. This was because blacks were seeking a greater role in controlling their own affairs in the civil rights movement and viewed most whites as uh, outsiders and uh, uh, interlopers, people who were coming in uh, and being good uh, but really, the, the movement had to be all black. Uh, at the same time, what happened was that uh, Vietnam was becoming a greater and greater focus in America, uh, especially after 1964, uh, when President Johnson decided to uh, uh, expand, I suppose is the word to use, uh, escalate the war in uh, Vietnam. Uh, white students forced out of their political activism by blacks in the civil rights movement found a ready home for radicalism uh, within the uh, uh, anti-war movement. Uh, at this time, as I as mentioned earlier, never, never had as many Americans been enrolled in universities uh, as n the period between 1965 and 1970. Uh, over 7 million Americans were attending colleges and universities. and. Part of this growth was due to students avoiding the war. Many uh, simply uh, did not want to join the army, had no place to go. And I'm sure you are all familiar with the student uh, who is in school simply because he has nowhere else to go, doesn't know what to do, so he goes to a, a university. And in, in uh, the United States, this is... Uh, perhaps uh, more common than it uh, should be. The whole war effort in Vietnam threw American colleges and universities into an extraordinary turmoil. Certainly the effect uh, of the war on American society uh, has been as influential and as jolting as anything that has happened in American society uh, since uh, World War II. And I would include in, in this uh, the assassination of John Kennedy. 
because the war created a conflicting set of values, the values of patriotism as opposed to what many felt was morally a wrong war. Uh, Americans had been taught uh, that uh, there were no bad wars, uh, though a close examination of American history would quickly tell you that uh, only one war that the United States has ever fought had literally no opposition, almost none, and that was World War II. Every other American war has had a significant block of people opposed to it. But this confusion of values, the change uh, between a generation that saw American patriotism uh, and the stake of American power in Vietnam uh, was uh, against those who did not see that was an extraordinary, uh, Americans use the term polarization, that is uh, a, set of, uh, a set of ideas on this side strongly opposed to the set of ideas on that side and there was no ground in the middle for discussion and so uh, you probably saw on your newscast uh, the people who Richard Nixon called the middle Americans or the, the hard hats who wore the hard plastic caps or metal hats who would uh, uh, oppose those who uh, were against the war uh, who always were pictured as those with beards uh, or uh, called hippies and uh, with the, the uh, usually sloppy clothes. Uh, they were also divided by age. There was a generation gap. That is to say that uh, if you were older than 30 years old, you were on one side. If you were younger than 30, uh, you were on the other side. このテープまだだいぶ続くんですけど、とこれゆっくりですけどね、中身は濃いですから、言葉にあまり無駄がないんで、同時通訳訳すには訳しにくいかと思います。で、この間からお話しているように、日本語に訳すときに、もう手に負の一つ一つのシラブルを大事にして、一つでも音を減らすってことですよ。例えばというようなね、なんかあの、for instance というのがありました。例えば、それなんか本当に例えばだけでいいんで、例えば、例としてはというふうにやる必要はないし、あるいはあの、日本語をリピートする癖がどうしても最初のうちあるんです。これでいいかなと思ってですね、えー、文章を訳し始めるときは何だかよくわからないけども、聞き終わってわかったのでですね、もう一度、ダメ押しに後ろから訳すってことをやるんですね。これもやらない方がいいです。シラブルはできるだけ少なく、ミニマムのシラブルでですね、中身を全部訳すということを考えなくちゃいけませんので、何でも音を出せばそれは通訳だっていうんじゃないんですからね。出せば出すほどさ雑音で聞いてる方にはあの苦痛になるわけですから、シラブルを少なくする、少なくても通じるような日本語に工夫していかなくちゃいけないですね。それでまあ言ったようにあのひっくり返すっていうことがどうしても必要だし、それからあのいらない字は。音として出さない、訳さない、日本語そのものですね、もう工夫しなきゃいけないんです、音を工夫するってことです、それからこれ今、こちらでお聞きしてますとね、あのこう口に出してやってらっしゃる方の場合でも、声があの弱いですね、大きい、小さいなくて、力が弱いです、説得力がないですよ、ですから聞いてて、安心してこう通訳、安心して聞いてるって感じにならないんですね、なんかこう、自信のない声の響きですから。で通訳してる人が自信があるかないかってことはもうオーディエンスは敏感に分かりますからね日本語だけ聞いてる人はですからあの安心感をオーディエンスに与えるっていう必要がありますからそれはもう声にどうしても出てくるんですそれでまあ,あの時々は自分の声を録音にとって聞いてみれば今どんなことになってるかってことが分かりますからでいつも言うように自分が通訳してるつもりでもね
実は全然通訳になってないってことがあるんでこの通訳の仕事っていうのは聞く人が納得して初めて仕事になってるわけですからね自分が訳したつもりになってても聞いてる人はさっぱり分かんないっていうことあるんです早口になんかベラベラ喋ってて自分は全部訳したつもりでいるかもしれないけど聞いてる人は何も分かんないっていうことありますからそれじゃあですねえー、っとあまり時間がないんですけどちょっと休みましてこの後ちょっと休んでからあの日英の同時の練習をしますで毎年ですね結局そういうコンセンサスになるんですっていうのはやってもどうせできないから時間が無駄だということになるんですけど一応こういうものだというですね、えー、入門のとこだけね皆さんやっていただいて練習していただいてそれからあとですねもう今学期もあと23週間しかありませんけども、えー、10月以降に今少しずつ繰り返してやりたいと思いますけども。いつもですとあの後期にやるんですけど今年は僕があ,のあんまり来られませんでしたからそれであの今日からちょっとだけやりますので,で中にはですね自分は英日は弱いけれども弱いというか増え,増えてたけれども日本語から英語訳するなら得意であろうと錯覚を起こしている特に女性の方に多いんですけどもどういうことになるかですねちょっとあのやってみます。で英日日ののの場場合合ででででもももそうですけども途中で絶対に文章を放棄できないっていうことですね。絶対放棄できない。それはもう鉄則ですから。じゃあちょっと休んでからやりますから。の挨拶です。